December the 16th, 1775, Hampshire, England. George and Cassandra Austin gave birth to what was to become one of the most widely read authors in English literature. Within her lifetime, Jane Austen wrote six complete novels, which over the last two centuries have been translated into multiple languages and have been adapted into many motion pictures. This year marks the 200th anniversary of her second and arguably her most popular published novel, Pride and Prejudice. Her millions of fans around the world today are celebrating this great landmark. So we set out to places like Chawton in Hampshire, where she spent some of her time writing and living all the way over to Cardiff, South Wales, where the youth of today took Pride and Prejudice to the next level in a rather peculiar way. What we went out to discover was what went on inside the mind of Austen, to see how extreme these novels have influenced the people of different generations and to find out who exactly was Jane Austen. This is Austen at 200. My name is Dr Gillian Dow, I'm a Director of Research here at Chawton House Library and I also work at the University of Southampton. The point of Chawton House Library is to really highlight all the women writers of the long 18th century who inspired Jane Austen herself, whether they be fellow novelists or playwrights or women who wrote what we call conduct literature, they're all included in the library here and we research all of them. As far as Jane Austen herself is concerned, um, very little is known about her life, in fact. It's interesting that there wasn't much that happened to her. She never married, she lived with her mother and her sister in her final years, and she wrote six wonderful novels that have lasted um, 200 years. Louise West, curator at the Jane Austen House Museum. She's often called the first modern English novelist, and I think you'd only have to read anything that was written before Jane Austen to realise why she's called that, because actually it does read like a modern novel in many ways, that the way um, her plots are crafted, um, her characterisation, the great psychological depth of her characters, which you don't get in 18th century novels normally. Anna Lee Talent, Education Officer at the Jane Austen House Museum. Jane Austen was born in 1775. Uh, she came from a very literary family, although neither of her parents were professional writers. Uh, her father was a clergyman and she was quite precocious from an early age. She seems to have been a devout Christian, she seems to have been a devoted aunt, but we don't have an awful lot of biographical information about that. She didn't keep a journal and diary, as far as we know. Not much was written about her during her own lifetime, so we have to go back to the letters. Tell me, do you and your sisters very often walk to Meryton? Yes, we often walk to Meryton. It's a great opportunity to meet new people. In fact, when you met us, we just had the pleasure of forming a new acquaintance. Mr Wickham's blessed with such happy manners as may ensure his making friends. Whether he is capable of retaining them is less certain. He's been so unfortunate as to lose your friendship. I dare say that is an irreversible event. It is. Why do you ask such a question? To make out your character. What have you discovered? Very little. I hear such different accounts of you as puzzle me exceedingly. I hope to afford you more clarity in the future. Funny enough, Jane Austen was not hugely popular when she was writing. Although she did sell some works and she made some money from her books, she wasn't famous like she is today. One of her nephews wrote a memoir, a sort of biography about her in the late part of the 19th century, and interest started to rise in her work from that point. The fact was that Jane Austen or her family destroyed the manuscripts after the work was published. It was seen to be they were no longer needed. Jackie Granger librarian of the Chawton House Library. Suddenly people are buying these books to read at the station, like we do, pick up a paperback. Um, and she's being handed around, a cheap disposable paperback, people are reading her. And slowly but surely, she becomes part of the literary landscape. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. 
However little known the feelings or views of such a man may be on his first entering a neighbourhood, this truth is so well fixed in the minds of the surrounding families that he is considered as the rightful property of someone or other of their daughters. My dear Mr. Bennet, said his lady to him one day, have you heard that Netherfield Park is let at last? The famous opening of Pride and Prejudice immediately alerts us to the brilliance and subtlety of Jane Austen's skills. With superbly precise technique, Jane Austen has progressively identified a setting, a situation and a character, Mrs. Bennet, and given a clear signal of the satiric amusement with which all three are to be viewed. The Jane Austen House Museum uh, is the house where Jane Austen lived and she wrote or revised all of her major works, including Pride and Prejudice, probably her most popular novel. I think it's the pr Pride and Prejudice that brings so many people to this house um, to, to see where it was created, although people do love the other novels. I mean, I used to come here a lot before I worked here, and basically I wasn't that interested in Jane Austen. I was interested in Elizabeth Bennet, and I was trying to find her somewhere, you know. And um, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating the way that keeps bringing people here. We know she was working on a manuscript called First Impressions in the 1790s, and we know that that became Pride and Prejudice, but we're not exactly sure when that happened. There is no manuscript of Pride and Prejudice. All we have are the first editions. Jane Austen's probably the most famous woman novelist to have written in English. I would say that she's probably the most popular writer after Shakespeare and we have many people who visit the museum who come from all over the world. Her work has been translated into many different languages. Pride and Prejudice is one of the most translated British texts of all time. There are many, many 20th century translations into languages as obscure as um, Galician from northern Spain to as mainstream as German, say. And there are many rival translations as well, so it can be very confusing for a foreign reader who goes into the bookshop and sees five different translations in front of them. How do you choose which one is the best? Well, I'm Dr. Shelley Cobb from the University of Southampton, where I teach in both the English and film departments. And I'm interested in film and television adaptations about women's stories in general, but today I've been talking about the various adaptations of Pride and Prejudice. Oh, Mr. Darcy, when I think of how I've misjudged you, the, the horrible things I said, I'm so ashamed. Oh, no, it's I who should be ashamed of my arrogance my stupid pride. Only oh. really when the movies start, you know, black and white movies with Laurence Olivier, he's some people, he's still some people's Mr. Darcy because it's the first one they saw. And one of my volunteers always says, my library volunteers, that, um, that Laurence Olivier was definitely yeah. her Mr. Darcy and he'll always, and Darcy will always look like Laurence Olivier. But for every generation, there's a different Darcy. The very first one is from 1940, starring Laurence Olivier and um, Greer Garson. And then there's not another film one until the recent, uh, fairly recent 2005 version starring Keira Knightley and Joe Wright. But there are several television adaptations, the most famous of which generally now we think of as being the 1995 version. Mr. Doss? Miss Bennett. I... Uh... I did not expect to see you, sir. We understood all the family from home, or we should never have presumed... I returned a day early. Excuse me, your parents are in good health. Uh, yes, they are very well. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm glad to hear it. There are several BBC adaptations throughout the decades between 1940 and 1990. There's another big one in 1980 that lots of people remember. The room is full of pleasant girls and some of them uncommonly pretty too. The eldest Miss Bennet, perhaps, but you're dancing with her. Oh, she's the most beautiful creature I ever beheld. But she has a sister. She has all too many sisters. Miss Elizabeth Bennet is charming. She is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt her. But it's after 1995 and Colin Firth where this sort of explosion of interest in Pride and Prejudice and various adaptations. The overriding um, popularity of Austen at the moment is, is a huge modern phenomena, maybe to some extent encouraged by the films. I 
I don't actually think there's one version that's the best version or the most faithful version because every version's different and every version's different than the novel. It's impossible for any film or television adaptation to be completely faithful, even in the long television adaptations because in our mind's eye, we have our own adaptation version, right? We imagine Darcy in a certain way. We imagine Elizabeth in a certain way. And as soon as you put an actor in that role, chances are pretty high they're not going to fit your imagination, right? So they're never going to be perfectly faithful. But each one picks up on something that still has a faithful element to it, something that's core within the text, that's, that's central. Um, but there could be lots of different bits. Lots of scholars still are debating about what exactly is the most important thing about Pride and Prejudice. What's the story really about? Sleep. Nora, my aunt. Yes, she was here. How can I ever make amends for such behavior? After what you have done for Lydia, and I suspect for Jane also, it is I who should be making amends. You must know. Surely you must know. It was all for you. And all the adaptations sort of engage with those debates by the different things they emphasize or how much they change it. But they're also meant to appeal to every different generation and their expectations on what is a romantic story um, and one that has some, some comedy elements to it. So in some ways each generation, each set of viewers over the years has its own version um, on the screen of Pride and Prejudice. In terms of her influence in British literature, um, this is very hard to gauge, actually. She's sometimes called the mother of the realist novel. So any novel that talks about real people and real situations um, seems to have come from her in the 19th century. There are often comparisons made between contemporary novelists like Walter Scott, who was more popular in the period than Jane Austen was. Um, she can be compared to later novelists like the Bronte sisters, although she Charlotte Bronte famously said she didn't like her. There's clearly some inspiration there, I think. My personal thoughts are that um, in terms of her legacy and the reason why she's still read today is that she, she writes very compelling characters. She writes characters that we all know and recognise. Even though these characters are 100 and, uh, 100, over 100 years old, 200 years old, in fact, um, they are characters we see in our everyday life. So Mr Collins from Pride and Prejudice, we all know someone as annoying as him. I thank you for your compliments. I am very sensible of the honour of your proposals, but... It is impossible for me to accept them. <laughs> yes, I am by no means discouraged, indeed not. I understand that it is usual with young ladies to reject the addresses of the man they secretly mean to accept when he first applies for their favour, and therefore I shall help my dear cousin to lead you to the altar before long. Her influence on modern literature, 20th and 21st century literature, is extensive. She was very influential for women writers in particular, so Virginia Woolf is a famous example of someone who went back again and again to Jane Austen throughout her lifetime. Elizabeth Taylor is another novelist who published extensively in the 1940s. Again, Jane Austen was very important for her. Um, it was the 20th century that really saw a huge rise in the popularity of Jane Austen. And I think her influence on British literature now, I think she's very influential. I think she's a timeless writer and all the great writers are timeless in that they can write about people because although events and times change, people never actually change. So the really great writers will write about human nature and of course because that never changes over the years, their writing is still as relevant two, three hundred years in advance. I'm Alice Key, I'm a student and I've done work experience at Jane Austen's House Museum. Um, I love Pride and Prejudice because I think Mrs Bennet is the greatest comic creation in pretty much, well, not all of English literature, but a lot of English literature. You have called on him! I'm afraid we cannot escape the acquaintance now. Oh, my dear Mr Bennet! <laughs> 
How good you are to us! Yeah, well, well. <laughs> Shakespeare and Chaucer can be read now and appreciated and Jane Austen can as well and I think her strength lies in her depictions of character um, because you can read a Jane Austen novel and you can recognise all of the characters in there usually you can find someone in one of those characters uh, elements of that person you will find in people that you know yourself and you'll think oh I know somebody just like that and I think that's really really clever and a mark of great genius. With the 200th anniversary fast approaching, we wanted to know what events are out there to celebrate this great landmark. We've already hosted um, a study day with four um, speakers on the, on the topic. We're going to be hosting more evening lectures. There will be a Regency Ball. There's a big academic conference at the beginning of July 2013. So there's a lot of celebrating happening here in the village of Chawton because, of course, it was in the village of Chawton that Jane Austen published her novels from. Within the last century, there have been many adaptations on the various works of Austen. However, none have been done quite like this. 200 years since Pride and Prejudice was first published, students at the Cardiff University Operatic Society have presented to us the Pride and Prejudice Opera, and the Society's president, Guy Withers, explains to us the process of this transformation and how the 200th anniversary actually came just as a pure coincidence. I've always been a fan of Pride and Prejudice and have been aware of, of Austen and her novels for a long time. Uh, and in fact, it was a singing friend of mine that suggested adapting one of the novels uh, as, as a text for opera. And I thought it was a fantastic idea with it being so famous. With it being the 200th year anniversary, it's kind of been everywhere. And so I've, I have met people who have also been celebrating Austen through other things book talks and, and um, just celebrating generally the, the bicentenary. Um, it, so it's been wonderful to kind of talk to these people who also love Austin and who also done their own uh, adaptions and be part of this kind of aura that is surrounded to this, uh, this celebration. I found the Lizzie Bennet Diaries as well on YouTube and I'm a fan of that so I've watched all that as well. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. My name is Lizzie Bennett, and this is my life. Always kind of I've tried to immerse myself in Austin, her world, and all the different adaptions of Pride and Prejudice, so I could kind of take inspiration from my own production um, and one that would be relevant for today as well, make sure that people actually understood and, 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 and kind of enjoyed it as much as possible. We've had to kind of had a bit of an artistic license of what we've done with Austin, try to take as much from her book as possible uh, using as much actual text. We, we, we really thought it was important to use actual um, dialogues and conversations from the book. It was my idea to kind of create a conversational aspect of the production that was similar to a play or a film script. So rather than writing actual songs, I wanted to create kind of five or ten minute scenes um, that then people could kind of have musical conversations with each other. I felt that was much more uh, kind of declamatory, much more natural, um, in the way it was presented, um, and it, in its kind of a more uh, contemporary way of looking at opera. We kind of uh, broke out of the university sphere um, and brought some new people to the world of Austin. But overall, uh, a lovely response from uh, audience members, but also the cast, they really enjoyed it, and uh, people at the theatre as well, they seemed to really like it as well. But uh, as for Pride and Prejudice, I don't know, we'll see what the future brings. Her death came at the surprising age of 41, on the early morning of the 18th of July, 1817. She was buried on the 24th of July, and her resting place is at Winchester Cathedral in Hampshire. Who 
Who was Austin to know that her work would be produced into a whole library of various celebrated adaptations and bring her millions of fans to this day? It just goes to show how far her work has come since it was first published back in 1813.